Hi, welcome to my ECG video blog. I'm Ken Grauer, and this is my 10th ECG video blog. Today's topic involves the basics of rhythm diagnosis, with emphasis on assessment of the patient and the five key parameters used to assess any arrhythmia. Our basic approach is both easy to remember and accurate and should take no more than a matter of seconds to apply. We cover more complex arrhythmias in our other videos, but for now, this video is devoted to review of the basics. Once again, for your convenience, I've made a website that lists key links to my ECG blog, my video blogs, and my introductory and advanced books and EPUBs on ECG interpretation. Above all is my email address. Please write me with your comments, feedback, and questions. On to today's topic. In our overall perspective is the large topic, which is not only rhythm diagnosis, but also management. So my overall goal in my series of videos is to ultimately cover both evaluation and management of the common arrhythmias you are likely to see. The keys to this goal are first to consider the clinical setting, and then next to determine the rhythm. The rest is easy. Once you appreciate the clinical setting and know what the rhythm is, the management of cardiac arrhythmias becomes far simpler. Please note that links to our three-part video and other handout material on arrhythmia management can be found on our arrhythmia webpage at www.aafpecg.com. But for now, in this video, our focus will primarily be on the basics of rhythm diagnosis. Having said that, the first principle of rhythm interpretation is that appreciation of the clinical setting is key for accurate diagnosis of the rhythm. For example, consider this rhythm. There is sinus bradycardia at a rate just below 50 per minute. If you were asked to assume clinical management of this patient, what is the first thing you would want to know? The answer, of course, is the clinical setting. That's because if this was the patient, a healthy 30-year-old man who jogs daily, then sinus bradycardia at a rate just below 50 per minute would not be a concern, but is probably just the normal bradycardia so commonly seen in healthy athletes. On the other hand, what if the clinical setting was this? Cardiac arrest and no pulse. Same rhythm on the monitor, that is, sinus bradycardia at a rate just below 50 per minute. What is the rhythm now? The answer is PEA, pulseless electrical activity, because we see an ECG rhythm on the monitor, but there is no pulse for this patient who is in cardiac arrest. Same ECG rhythm, but a very different interpretation in this case, depending on the clinical scenario in which this rhythm is seen. Let's look at one more example to illustrate how the clinical setting is key. What if this was the rhythm, and the clinical setting was that your patient had just collapsed? The paramedics are on the scene. They find the patient to be unresponsive, no pulse, and no respirations. What to do next? With a little hint in the upper right corner. The answer, of course, is to defibrillate the patient as soon as possible, as we have just defined the conditions of cardiac arrest. On the other hand, what if the clinical setting was this? Your patient has just collapsed, and the rhythm on the monitor is again this. But instead of being unresponsive, your patient is now opening his eyes, and he is alert and talking what not to do next. Remember, the first step we are taught when working with mannequins while learning CPR is to ask, Annie, Annie, are you okay? If Annie says yes, then don't shock Annie. So how can this happen, that a patient is awake and alert with the rhythm shown here? 
lots of ways, as it's easy for a lead to fall off in the emergency situation of getting ready as fast as you can to defibrillate a patient. But the bottom line is that we can't interpret rhythms in a vacuum without at least a brief idea of what is wrong with the patient. Enough on the clinical setting. Let's move on to assessment of rate and rhythm. The user-friendly approach that we favor entails assessment of five parameters for each and every rhythm that you encounter. Actually, there's a sixth parameter, which we've already alluded to. Is the patient in front of you hemodynamically stable? because if the patient is not stable as a direct result of the rapid rate, then it no longer matters if the rhythm is supraventricular or ventricular tachycardia, since in either case, immediate cardioversion is emergently needed. But once you've ensured that your patient is stable, determining the rhythm is best accomplished by conscious appraisal of five key parameters. Remembering these five key parameters is easy. Just remember to watch your P's and Q's and the three R's. Let's look at these one at a time. Are there P waves? Is the QRS complex wide or narrow? Remember, it takes 0.20 seconds to record one large box on ECG grid paper. Therefore, half of one large box takes 0.10 seconds to record. And that, very conveniently, is the upper limit of normal for QRS duration in adults. Why do we care if the QRS is wide or narrow? Because this tells you where the impulse is likely to be coming from. I'll emphasize that it doesn't matter if the QRS measures 0.09 second or 0.0999 second, since both of these are normal. All we care about is whether the QRS is or is not more than half a large box in duration. Finally, the reason we don't use 0.12 seconds as our definition of wide is that some forms of ventricular tachycardia, such as fascicular VT, may only have a QRS duration of 0.11 seconds. The last three parameters are recalled by the three R's. So we look to see if the rhythm is regular, if P waves are present, whether these P waves are related to a neighboring QRS complex, and what is the rate? Let me emphasize that it doesn't matter in what sequence you ask yourself the five parameters, and we often change the sequence we use, depending on what is easiest to assess on the arrhythmia we are looking at. All that counts is that you always look for the P's, Q's, 3 R's in every rhythm you encounter. Only in this way will you avoid missing any important findings, as we'll illustrate during the course of this video. So, what about P waves? Or, as the French say, il faut chercher le P. Rather than narrowing our search to forward conducting P waves, we expand it to also include fib waves, flutter waves, and retrograde P waves. So we look for evidence of atrial activity. If there is atrial activity, we then want to know if this is normal atrial activity, which we define as a sinus mechanism. Key point. A sinus P wave should be what? In lead two, it should be upright. So much so that if the P wave is not upright in lead two, then you don't have sinus rhythm, with two exceptions. What are these two exceptions? That is, what are the only two times when you may still have a sinus mechanism despite the presence of a negative P wave in lead two? The two exceptions are one, dextrocardia, and two, lead reversal. We know which of these is more common. Even highly experienced 
technicians may, on rare occasion, record an ECG with the wrong lead placement. But the point to emphasize is the importance of always spending two to three educated seconds with focus on lead two to see if an upright P wave with fixed PR interval is present, because if not, then you don't have a sinus rhythm. Why then is it that the P wave should always be upright in lead two when the rhythm is sinus? Think of the path of normal depolarization. The impulse begins in the SA node. From there, it rapidly travels over specialized intraatrial conduction fibers until it arrives at the AV node. The overall direction of this depolarization vector, as the impulse travels from the SA node through the atria to arrive at the AV node, is virtually parallel to the perspective of standard lead 2 that by Eindhoven's triangle views the path of cardiac activation from a frontal plane angle of 60 degrees. Therefore, if the impulse begins in the SA node, as it should with sinus rhythm, then from the perspective of standard lead two, the overall path of atrial depolarization should be viewed as coming toward lead two, which is why the ECG writes a positive P wave in lead two. Let's apply this essential point clinically. Is this a sinus rhythm? I'll highlight the key finding. Assuming the leads are placed correctly and the heart lies on the left side of the chest, this can't be a sinus rhythm because the P wave is not upright in this lead to rhythm strip. Whether the rhythm is junctional, low atrial, or something else is unimportant. What counts is that all it takes is brief perusal of a lead to rhythm strip to know that the rhythm isn't sinus. In contrast, this is a sinus rhythm because each QRS complex is preceded by a P wave with a fixed PR interval in the standard lead two. Let's extend our clinical application to a 12 lead tracing. Is the rhythm for this ECG sinus? What do you think? Which of the 12 leads should we look at first to answer this question? The answer is lead two. As we focus on lead two, why do we know that the rhythm is not sinus? The answer is because there is no upright P wave in lead two. In fact, there is no P wave at all in lead two. We know this for certain because in addition to the three beats seen within the 12 lead ECG, we are provided with a long lead to rhythm strip at the bottom of this tracing. All it takes is a few educated seconds to look in front of each QRS complex in this long lead two, which allows us to verify that there is no identifiable P wave anywhere in lead two. Therefore, the rhythm is not sinus. Are P waves present elsewhere? Let's look at the other five limb leads. And sure enough, small but definitely present upright P waves are seen in leads one and AVL, blue arrows. In addition, it appears that a negative P wave with fixed PR interval is seen preceding each QRS complex in lead three, green arrow. Bottom line. This is not a sinus rhythm. It's actually a low atrial rhythm, though the specific rhythm diagnosis is much less important than the steps in the process. When looking for P waves, look first in lead two. Ideally, you'll have a long lead two to look at. It should take no more than two to three seconds to carefully search this long lead two for upright P waves. If none are present, then assuming no dextrocardia or lead misplacement, the rhythm is not sinus. We then look at other leads to see if atrial activity is present, as it turns out to be in this ECG. But unless one consciously and routinely always looks for the presence of an upright P wave in lead two, it is amazingly easy to overlook the fact that sinus rhythm may not be present.
Let's now turn our attention to rate, which when one-to-one -one conduction is not present may pertain to the atrial as well as ventricular rate. There are many ways to calculate rate. The easiest one, and the one we favor, is the rule of 300. When the rhythm is regular, simply divide 300 by the number of large boxes in the R to R interval to come up with a reliable estimation of rate. It's insightful to review how this rule is derived. Assuming a standard recording speed of 25 millimeters per second, the time required to record one large box on ECG grid paper is 0 0.20 second or one-fifth of a second, which means that the amount of time needed to record five large boxes on ECG grid paper is 0 0.20 second times five or one second. Note, these measurements assume that we are using a recording speed of 25 millimeters per second. On occasion, you may see a rhythm strip recorded at double speed, or 50 millimeters per second. Some providers like the 50 millimeter per second speed because it spaces out the beats. However, it changes the look of the ECG because all intervals, including the width of the QRS complex, then look to be twice as long. To avoid confusion, our preference is to stick to a single recording speed of 25 millimeters per second, which is the standard speed used in the United States. So sticking to a recording speed of 25 millimeters per second, how do we apply these measurements to get the rule of 300? Well, if a complex occurs every large box or every one-fifth of a second, then five complexes will occur in one second times 60 seconds in one minute equals a rate of 300 per minute by the rule of 300. If, on the other hand, the rate was half as fast so that a QRS complex occurred every two large boxes, then the rate would be half as fast or 300 divided by two, which equals a rate of 150 per minute. If a complex only occurred every three large boxes, the rate would be 300 divided by three or 100 per minute, and so on and so forth. A complex every four large boxes corresponds to a rate of 300 divided by four or 75 per minute. A complex every five large boxes to a rate of 300 by five or 60 per minute. And that's the rule of 300. Let's calculate some rates. What is the approximate rate for this rhythm? Since the rhythm is regular, we can use the rule of 300. Pick a QRS complex that begins or ends on a heavy line, as shown here. The R to R interval until the next QRS complex is just under four large boxes, as shown by the white line. By the rule of 300, if the R to R interval was precisely three large boxes, then the rate would be 300 divided by three or 100 per minute. If the R to R interval was exactly four large boxes, the rate would be 300 by four or 75 per minute. Since the R to R interval is between three to four large boxes, the rate must be between 75 to 100 per minute. But since it's closer to four than to three large boxes, this means that the rate must be closer to 75 per minute or about 80 per minute. The rule of 300 works equally well when the rate is slow, as shown here. The rate is again regular. Once again, we start with a QRS complex that begins or ends on a heavy line. We count over and note that the R to R interval is between nine to 10 large boxes. By the rule of 300, if the R to R interval was exactly 10 large boxes, then the rate would be 300 divided by 10 or 30 per minute. Since the R to R interval is a little less than 10 large boxes in duration, 
the rate must be a little bit faster than 30 per minute or about 32 to 33 per minute. Accurate estimation of heart rate is especially important when the rate is fast, as diagnosis of the specific type of supraventricular rhythm often depends on knowing the rate. For example, is the rate of this regular supraventricular rhythm over or under 200 per minute? Slight modification of the rule of 300 into what we call the every other beat method allows us to determine the answer to this question in no more than a few seconds. Once again, we select a QRS complex that begins or ends on a heavy line. If we simply use the rule of 300, we'd say that the R to R interval is between one to two large boxes, which means that the rate is between 150 to 300 per minute. But there is just too much leeway between this wide rate range. By using the every other beat method, we can quickly come up with a much more accurate answer. Just look at the R to R interval of every other beat. The R to R interval of half the rate is three large boxes. This means that half the rate equals 300 divided by three, or about 100 per minute. Therefore, the actual rate is twice that amount, or approximately 200 per minute. With a little bit of practice, it becomes easy to very quickly come up with an accurate estimation of heart rate, even when the rate of the rhythm is fast. Well, before we conclude part one of this video on arrhythmia diagnosis, we need to highlight an essential reality inherent in assessment of QRS width. Is the QRS complex that we show in lead three here wide? We'll provide you with a few more leads to facilitate your answer. And we'll even magnify lead three to give you a better look. Is the QRS complex that we show here wide? So what is missing? What's missing are the remaining eight leads, which we now show. From these remaining leads, there should be little doubt that the QRS complex is wide. The reason this wasn't apparent in several of the leads on this 12 lead ECG is that at times, part of the QRS complex may lie on the baseline. It may therefore be easy to miss that the QRS complex is wide if one only looks at a limited number of leads. Moral of the story, 12 leads are better than one. If your patient in a regular tachycardia of uncertain etiology is hemodynamically stable, then getting a 12 lead ECG during the tachycardia may prove invaluable for determining the true width of the QRS complex, as well as for detecting things like atrial activity that may only be evident in some of the leads. 12 leads are better than one. Let's now apply what we've covered thus far. What is the rhythm shown here? Before answering, don't forget to assess the first priority, which is to determine if the patient is or is not hemodynamically stable. We routinely assess this first since clinical management will be very different if the patient is not stable. This patient is stable which allows us to proceed to the next step in rhythm diagnosis, which is to assess the five key parameters. We recall these five parameters by the saying, watch your P's and Q's and the three R's. We strongly suggest that even if you know what the rhythm is, that you still systematically assess these five key parameters before stating your diagnosis in whatever sequence is easiest for you for the rhythm at hand. In this case, there are no P waves in this lead to rhythm strip. The rhythm is regular and the rate is about 115 per minute as the R to R interval is a bit less than three large boxes in duration. We next look at QRS width. At least in this one lead, the QRS complex is clearly narrow. 
The importance of determining that the QRS complex is narrow is that it tells us with 99% certainty that the impulse is supraventricular. That is, that the impulse originates from at or above the AV node, or from at or above this double dotted line. For practical purposes, this means that the impulse must be originating from the SA node, from somewhere within the atria, or from the AV node. In this particular case, the rhythm is not coming from the SA node, because there is no sinus P wave in this lead 2. It's also not coming from the atria, because we don't see any P wave at all in this lead 2, which means that the impulse must be coming from the AV node. As we'll see a little later in this video series, this is an accelerated junctional rhythm. But for now, the key point is to appreciate how we use the P's, Q's, 3R approach to assess the rhythm. So, with the rare exception that a regular narrow QRS rhythm without P waves might be coming from a part of the conduction system, like the bundle of Hiss that is located below the AV node, confirming that the QRS complex is narrow essentially confirms that the rhythm is supraventricular. However, the opposite is not necessarily true. Consider the rhythm here, in which the QRS complex is obviously wide. The finding of a wide QRS does not reliably tell us from where the impulse originates. For example, in this case, what are the arrows pointing to? Despite QRS widening, the rhythm is sinus with the wide QRS being explained by the presence of bundle branch block. What happens is that the impulse originates from the sinus node and travels quickly until it encounters that part of the ventricular conduction system that is blocked. This results in a sinus rhythm with QRS widening due to bundle branch block. In contrast to this final example, in which the QRS complex is again wide, but no P waves are present. This defines the rhythm as originating from the ventricles. Time to stop. This is the end of part one in our video series on the basics of rhythm diagnosis. In subsequent parts, We'll be applying the systematic P's, Q's, 3R approach that we developed here to clinical diagnosis of the most common supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. Remember this link where you can access and download my related materials on cardiac arrhythmias, www.aafpecg.com. This is Ken Grauer saying goodbye for now. Du plus loin que me revienne l'ombre de mes amours anciens.